Welcome. My name is John Glenn. I'm the Senior Director at the International Forum for Democratic Studies here at the National Endowment for Democracy. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the release of a report, Fighting Kleptocracy in an Age of Geopolitics by Ben Judah from the Atlantic Council. We at the Forum and at the Endowment have focused on combating transnational kleptocracy for some time, highlighting the way that the challenges of corruption have really become global and indeed defining challenges of our time. The report that we're here to talk about is an incredibly forward-looking report that looks at how this challenge has changed over time, and in particular in recent years, and challenges us to think forward about what we need to do next. It is also incredibly timely. Unfortunately, with the recent murder of Alexei Navalny, one of Russia's leading anti-corruption leaders in prison, we see just how pressing this issue is. The recent two-year mark since Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine begun in 2022, fueled by kleptocracy, highlights that this challenge is continuing and changing, and we need to be changing with it. We look ahead next month when we can expect the extension of Vladimir Putin's reign for a fifth term with little doubt as the outcome, highlights just how pressing these issues are. And I think that the report that we're going to discuss today and the work that we've been doing on transnational kleptocracy here at the Forum highlight that this is an issue that's really at the heart of the challenge. It's an issue at the heart of the challenge of democracy today, but it's also an issue at the heart of some of the national security challenges that are facing countries and democracies around the world in, as Ben says in his report, an era of geopolitics. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start by inviting Ben to say a few words, asking some questions about his report to lay out some of the key ideas. And then I'm also extremely pleased to be joined as well by two commentators. I'm really pleased to have Brett Carter with us. Brett's an assistant professor of political science and international relations at the University of Southern California and a Hoover fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. And by Zoe Ryder, who is director of combating kleptocracy here at the National Endowment for Democracy. So let me start with Ben Judah. Ben is the director of the Transform Europe Initiative and a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Europe Center. He was previously a fellow at the Hudson Institute here in Washington, D.C., but he's also been a fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations in London and the European Stability Initiative in Istanbul. He's the author of a number of books, and I'm really pleased that Ben has been able to gather his thoughts for us here in his work and enable us to, to take off this issue in a really important way. So maybe I can start with the first question. Ben, in your report, you provide what I think is actually a fairly nuanced assessment about the democratic response to curtail Putin's war chest, driven by kleptocracy and a recognition among the Western democracies that it is kleptocracy that helped fuel the war. So can I ask you, assess where we are here. Where do you see the successes that we've had over the past couple of years in what you call in the report uh, the rise of an anti-kleptocracy consensus? But also, where have you seen limits to this response that show what we need to do looking forward. Well, firstly, I'd like to thank everybody uh, for having me here today and for publishing the paper and for giving us a platform to talk about this incredibly important issue so soon after the murder of uh, Alexei Navalny. And I wanted to say, before we kind of jump in to uh, the foreign policy uh, side of this, that it was only sort of with his passing that it really kind of dawned on me the enormous impact that Alexei Navalny had had on British politics. You know, his campaign was always about London and not just about Moscow. It was always about Western enablement and not just uh, Russian kleptocracy. And in the conversations that I had the pleasure to have with him and his uh, associates and researchers, they always stressed that, you know, Britain uh, in particular had a particular role in the kleptocratic uh, system which Vladimir Putin had erected out of the ruins of uh, Russian democracy and Russian uh, communism, which was as a enabler and as a haven of uh, Russian illicit uh, wealth and as a playground for the Russian uh, elites. And I felt encouraged that... There was such a heavy discussion about him and his legacy, also in the UK, also in the British Parliament, with British political parties both competing to put forward uh, responses that turned his legacy 
into kind of practical achievements and not just into uh, into words. You know, really, the genesis of uh, this report uh, came from my increasing feeling over the last five or six years that a consensus around the need for anti-kleptocracy had formed in the main policy capitals of the West, but at the same time that that consensus found itself up against a very different geopolitical context from the one that it had come from. That consensus was built on the following principles. There needed to be um, strong, stronger anti-money laundering laws. There needed to be um, beneficial ownership systems, which tracked who owned uh, what in terms of corporate uh, entities. And, you know, there needed to be a kind of greater prioritization of this as a national security priority and not simply a kind of law enforcement or a domestic, um, domestic prior priority. But it happened at a moment that Russia found itself moving towards direct confrontation with um, many of the West's partners, such as uh, tragically Ukraine in February um, 2022. And also at the same time that China found itself moving into a period of uh, greater confrontation uh, with the with the West. And what that meant is that the original principles of that anti-kleptocracy consensus, that really all that needs to happen was that Western countries need to come together, strengthen rules and regulations, convince other partners and other international institutions to push those forward as well. And you can have real global uh, benefits uh, is no longer that simple. That approach in hindsight really to me looks very technocratic and it looks relatively geopolitically naive. It doesn't have really any geopolitics in it. And the key thing about geopolitics, when you look at that kind of wide open map as so many have done over so many uh, centuries and millennia is that it always forces you into prioritization and what i wanted to start thinking through in this report is that in an era of intensifying geopolitical uh, competition where does the west prioritize and how does it differ how does it deal with a world which you know is a harsh world and pushes us towards tough choices contradictory positions trade-offs between interests and values how do we as the anti-kleptocracy community dare i say how do we as people who want to see a greater focus on this issue work with that and accept that not deny it and come up with our own geopolitics for anti-kleptocracy so ben where are we today two years after that event how do you assess the state of the response you know i think we're um you know, the Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine ripped up what had been an understanding that Russian elites had about the access and the relationship they could have with the West. And this is best defined to me by the extensive uh, Russian billionaires' yachts uh, parked in the various sort of high-end uh, marinas of Europe. This cast of person felt that they could enjoy the benefits of authoritarianism in the East and enjoy the pleasures of uh, democracy and democratic capitalism in the uh, West. They felt that they could live between both societies and that they could enjoy, they could live between both societies and that that access was not a challenge to them. In fact, being able to live between two worlds kind of reinforced their strengths and their their strength and their position. And they felt that they could accumulate assets in the West and launder assets from the East in the in, in the West in order to extend their wealth and range, and to put them, of course, potentially beyond the reach of uh, the Russian regime if anything went wrong. With the full scale invasion of Ukraine, the West finally broke that entente by seizing, freezing and blocking access 
to the vast majority of these oligarch and regime figures' assets in uh, in the West. And that was a fundamental break in how the relationship had been uh, before. There was a lot, this came as part of a broader package of Russia sanctions, targeting different aspects of the Russian war-making economy and the Russian natural resources economy, the Russian banking system. And there was a moment of intense optimism as the ruble crashed that this could change the behavior of this Russian elite. It could force difficult choices on them, make them constrain Vladimir Putin, make them question the wisdom of the of the war, push them to the negotiating table, undermine their military in the field, and potentially uh, cause uh, questions about even the survivability of the regime. Now, we need to take now, as we approach the anniversary, as we approach um, a new uh, end of February with this calamity still going on in Ukraine, we need to take a kind of sober look at what was achieved. The achievements to me are that is this great disentanglement. We are no longer entangled with people whose interests are antithetical to ours, who are hostile to us and who wish our societies, our political systems and many people in our countries um, great harm. And that, for me, is a strong benefit, that you do not have henchmen of Vladimir Putin embedded and weaving their spiders' webs in Mayfair, in the 16e arrondissement, uh, or in the finer parts of uh, West Berlin. Second benefit is that those assets have themselves been frozen. Those uh, An asset is never simply an asset. It's a source of power. It's a source of activity. It's a source of range. It's a source of influence. And those assets could not be deployed into campaigns against Western support for Ukraine, against Ukraine, or to extend the influence of uh, the Russian state in uh, Western Europe and uh, across the European Union and beyond over the last two years. Both of those are strong uh, benefits. However, we have not seen, and we have to be honest about it, any reasonable change in Vladimir Putin's behaviour, any ability of the oligarchs or the wealthy in Russia to influence him or even any interest, it seems, in changing his calculus. We have not seen the Russian economy brought to its knees. We have not seen the um, Russian war effort uh, splutter. If anything, over the last year, we've seen the Russian war effort and the Russian war machine step up at an impressive rate, producing more shells than the United States and uh, and Europe. So we need to take a sober look at that, which is that kleptocracy was deployed, sorry, anti-kleptocracy rather, was deployed as a tool against an authoritarian rival. It had benefits in strengthening our own security, in firewalling us, in protecting us from that meddling. But it was not an ace in the pack when playing against a hardened autocratic regime. So we need to kind of think forward about what is our geopolitical approach and what role does kleptocracy have in that with Russia that is now a hardened autocratic state, a long-term, possibly generational material threat to Europe and beyond that will require a generational long-term material response. Where do we sit in that? And I think that that's a great way to kind of wind the discussion because that is a very different predicament than the one that we found ourselves in in the late 2010s as anti-kleptocracy activists, where we thought we were advocating for a technocratic fix, the technocratic rules that could either encompass some global situations or our own markets uh, and societies primarily, and that could have some kind of lasting impacts. It's a slightly different situation now.
Yeah, no, Ben, in your report, you say democracies will not be successful in advancing either their geopolitical interests or combating kleptocracy unless they recognize that these challenges are deeply related. And I would share your sense that this has really sort of changed the perceptions of Russia, oligarchs sitting on the boards of many prominent institutions and Western democracies and the law society. But the report also highlights some ways in which China is often overlooked in this regard and the ways in which China participates in kleptocratic networks around the world. Maybe briefly, can you share for us just some of the insights from the report about how these networks operate and why this aspect of their global influence may be less understood? There is an analytical tendency with a long pedigree to view Russia and China as very separate, very different entities, which require very different approaches from the United States. That's broadly true. Anyone can look at a map and can look at a pack of economic statistics and see the difference there. But in some ways, Russia and China today, in this hardened autocratic state, bear some deep similarities. And one of those similarities is that they are platforms for international elite and regime sponsored kleptocracy. One of the manners in which China is a global exporter of kleptocracy is a manner that affects countless American corporations, countless medium-sized businesses and enterprises in the United States and beyond, and that's IP theft. That is stealing technology. That is stealing critical insights, which are the fruit of the labors of American, European, African scientists, specialists, companies, and beyond, and taking those back to China and then converting that stolen technology, those stolen insights into new forms of power, authority, and influence. It is a form of theft. It is in many ways state-sponsored. It takes place on a mass level, and it has been undermining the level playing field for much too long. If you go and speak to any of the country's leading corporations, they will have a story about it. They will have a complaint about it. And this is not what free and fair competition looks like. Thank you. In another way, oh, sorry, please. That's the first way in which China is a global exporter of kleptocracy. In the second way, China is a global exporter of kleptocracy is embedded in its foreign policy. One of the core Chinese uh, defining international endeavors has been the Belt and Road Initiative, vast investments trying to create a hub and spooks new world order of infrastructure and debt and loans and partnerships reorienting the global economy in China's mind around Beijing, kleptocracy, corruption, bribery has been a core component of that since the beginning, used to ink contracts, open doors, cement deals, or as handshakes between political players on numerous levels. China, like Russia, uses kleptocracy to advance its interests internationally. So whether we look at the corporate field or whether we look at the diplomatic field, we see China as a kleptocratic actor. But discussion of Chinese kleptocracy, the prioritization of Chinese kleptocracy is very absent. Let's come back to the comparison with uh, Russia. If we would go back to one of those marinas in the Mediterranean where the luxury Russian super yachts are compounded, those owned by Chinese kleptocrats are free to sail and the champagne is still flowing. 
that is a that is a clear example of two different geopolitical approaches. It is currently useful to the West to apply anti-kleptocracy as a firm and tough tool against Russian elites and their assets abroad. It has hitherto not been useful to Western elites to deploy that against Chinese elites. So that's one of the core sort of differences um, differences there. And that really begs a question, which is, in a world of intensifying great power competition, how how do you make those difficult decisions? How do you make those difficult trade-offs? And that's one of the things I wanted to look at in the report. And thank you. I think actually that sort of it challenges this field to sort of think more broadly about how this operates. And I appreciate the changing context. Maybe I can turn to Brett to sort of pick up on one of the other elements that you talk about in the paper, where you talk about how this is also affecting, you know, not just Russia and China, but countries around the world in the global majority and the like. So, Brett, you published a terrific article recently in Foreign Affairs called Why the New Cold War Will Split Africa, where you talk about great power competition on the continent. Tell me, how do you see democracies exerting positive influence in this sphere that encourages transparency and accountability in Africa um, in this era of geopolitics, where we know that Russia and China, in different ways, are players? Yeah, of course. And I should say, uh, first, uh, thanks so much to uh, the National Endowment for Democracy um, and to the forum uh, for having me uh, and to my colleagues um, for this really uh, fascinating discussion. So I really see four broad strategies um, in terms of you know how the world's democracies uh, can advance uh, some of the concerns that Ben has just discussed. First, I think that we should acknowledge uh, that in this new uh, geopolitical competition, that Africa's autocrats are likely to align with Beijing and Moscow to a great extent, contrary to the preferences and the interests uh, of their citizens and for reasons that we all understand, right? Foreign aid uh, that can be targeted to supporters, uh, Huawei digital surveillance technology that can facilitate uh, targeted repression, financial flows, uh, of course, that can be siphoned, directed to supporters, uh, and insulation uh, from, from Western sanctions. So I think the key thing First, is that we need to do everything we can to help citizens uh, in Africa's autocracies create change, change for themselves. We need to help citizens mobilize by insisting on regular elections. And I should say, you know, we should insist on elections not because uh, you know, of some notion that change will come from the ballot box, but instead because change will come from the, from the streets and regular elections are focal points that facilitate those sorts of protests that help citizens organize. Um, in that vein, we should support journalists who are highlighting corruption and human rights abuses, uh, which help frustration coalesce into action. We need to make repression and corruption as costly as possible by imposing targeted sanctions, uh, pursuing international prosecutions uh, as, uh, as uh, possible. And I think, you know, to some extent, we need to um, incentivize uh, the African continent's autocrats to step down when we can by, sus by suspending sanctions um, and even international prosecutions. And I should say, you know, this will, uh, you know, I can imagine this will create some kind of difficult decisions for the international community. But again, you know, we need to remember that, uh, you know, kind of helping, right, kind of encouraging the continent's autocrats to step down is, is, is a really kind of a, a key, uh, a key part of this. Second, um, we need to, really offer a value proposition to Africa's democracies, to its democratically elected governments um, that uh, that rivals what Beijing has offered. And we can do so by delivering the sort of uh, infrastructure and investment opportunities that Beijing uh, has really been providing for the past decade, decade and a half. But, the, but Western governments can do so, you know, without uh, the obvious costs in terms of corruption, uh, in terms of surveillance. And I think there are a few things immediately that, that Western governments can do. In particular, Washington uh, can reauthorize and reform uh, the Development Finance Corporation. And that legislation uh, needs to be reauthorized by September uh, of next year. Um, there are a number of reforms that, that we can discuss uh, to do so. I think uh, the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment um, that the Biden administration 
uh, recently launched uh, in cooperation with some European partners, I think is a good start. But uh, the key thing, again, is that we need to, uh, to enhance it. We need to be more ambitious and, and we need to let some, the investments in some cases um, be guided by uh, the geopolitical playing field, right, by security interests. Um, and then, you know, I would also say, um, you know, part of, you know, offering a value proposition to, to Africa's democracies is to embrace institutional reforms that give the global south uh, a much stronger voice in international affairs. So far, Beijing and Moscow, you know, claim to, you know, to, to want these sorts of institutional reforms, you know, but by proposing concrete reforms, I think that Western governments uh, can, in a sense, you know, call, uh, call their bluff. The third kind of broad strategy uh, that uh, that I think that we need to prioritize um, focuses on the anti-coup norm that emerged after the Cold War ended. Um, you know, it's clear. You know, if if one you know looks at a map of the African continent, you know, there's now a uh, a coup belt that stretches uh, you know from the Atlantic to the Horn, um, which you know, sort of underscores the extent to which uh, this anti-Cold War, or I'm sorry, this anti-coup norm. Um, that has really yielded, you know, kind of tremendous benefits in terms of human rights, uh, democracy for for African citizens. You know, the extent to which that norm uh, is eroding, um, we can, you know, I'm hopeful that we can still reform it uh, by imposing sanctions. But I should say, you know, I, I'm I am somewhat concerned um, that it may be too late, right? Given uh, the you know the regime survival package. Um, that Moscow is now quite explicitly offering to uh, to governments uh, across the African continent, and then the final thing, I, the final thing I would I would say is that, um, and I think Ben's report uh, does a great job highlighting this. You know, Western governments need to live up you know to uh, to our collective values. Um, I think over the past you know decade and a half, uh, we've lost some moral high ground uh, that we had after the Cold War. Um, given support uh, for several you know, quite corrupt governments. One thinks uh, in particular, as, uh, as Ben's report highlighted, of uh, the Bongo family in Gabon, of the Opian family in Equatorial Guinea, where uh, Western governments you know, quite explicitly uh, you know, privileged cheap oil um, you know, rather than uh, basic rights of, of citizens in, in those particular countries. And you know, in losing this kind of moral high ground, I think that you know we've created some local constituencies, uh, you know, for the wave of recent coups across the continent. So I think you know a key thing is that we need to regain that moral high ground. And again, I think that uh, Ben's report does a great job emphasizing this. Thank you very much. Maybe Zoe, maybe I can turn to you. I think both the comments from Ben and from Brett really highlight sort of you know, the nature of the challenge of looking at Russia and the like, and they're talking about many of the things that governments need to do and the ways that governments could respond. But I think there's a somewhat of a clear consensus that any durable solution is going to actually have to combine both the government and the non-governmental sector. You know, you've spent much of your career working in this space. So maybe can I ask you your sense, following and picking up on some of the points in Ben's report, about how we can leverage the work that's being done by independent journalists and civil society groups in this fight against kleptocracy in this new era. Sure, I'm uh, honored to do so. And I just really wanna underscore that I fully um, support the central thrust of Ben's argument, which is geopolitics isn't sufficiently prioritizing this. And that, how to tackle that um, is, you know, I think, a. a critical focus of, of our work at NED and also for civil society. But I do want to step back in, in a minor quibble, which is that a lot of these so-called technocratic reforms are far from being fully implemented. By the time you get to sanctions, you're already at a point of, of, of weakness, right? And there's still so much more work to be done to achieve real systematic change. And the problem is, just to get any one of these laws passed. I was on the front lines of getting um, beneficial ownership transparency reforms passed in the United States. It requires so much political work and that cannot be understated. So I think the people who probably are best placed to understand the geopolitical challenge are those anti-kleptocracy activists who've been working for beneficial ownership transparency increased information sharing, all of that stuff, and, and not, you know, you know, 
not least of all, um, the sort of professional service providers enabling kleptocracy. And so I just want to say that, you know, we know that there's so much more work to be done along those lines, right? Um, and that the people doing that work really need more funding and they need greater physical and legal protection against the blowback from, from kleptocrats. Um, but again, to, set, to, to Ben's larger point, this is all incredibly urgent. And I would argue that there's, while all of this work needs to continue more, we need more, <laughs> we need more people on board doing this. We need the geopolitical will to continue to push on this. Like it's the most important priority because we can't have a pro-democracy agenda without an anti-kleptocracy, you know, platform that is robust and effective. Um, I do think there's a couple of tweaks that I'm starting to see from the civil society side um, that I think are really important um, and really interesting. And here, I, when I talk about civil society, I am talking about watchdog NGOs, but I'm also talking about academics. I'm talking about investigative journals. I see these as different pillars of civil society. And so where I see civil society starting to adapt to the challenge is really along two intersecting lines. The first is a, about focus, and there's an increased focus on the kleptocratic supply chains. So not just where kleptocrats are laundering their money, but where they're moving goods, services, um, people uh, in, 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 you know, to build their kleptocratic treasure chest. Uh, and here, like, for example, on February 21st, uh, just recently, you know, the OCCRP Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project uh, and their partners came out with a, a critical investigation showing how the Russian war machine is being supplied to Kazakh companies and Belarusian warehouses. And we've seen similar work um, in, in over the past year. We have also seen similar supply chain exposés linking Western suppliers to Putin's oil and gas empire. And in those cases, they were US academics, UK consultancy firm named Data Desk that does terrific work, along with watchdog groups and investigative journalists in Europe and Eurasia, uh, who are bringing visibility to the problem and pinpointing smart advocacy solutions, many of which also led to multiple new sanctions, of course. So that last example goes to sort of my second point about like the intersecting threads, where um, which is more about an adaptation and how we organize. I think we need to be networking our networks and more importantly, or just as importantly, distributing our capacities, our capacities for investigation, our capacities for detection, for reporting, for having really strong like policy and advocacy responses along multiple nodes of collaboration around the world. Um, so we don't just have, you know, big investigations over here, some big advocacy groups here, and you know, not enough interconnectedness and not enough of distributed capacity, decentralized capacity uh, along um, different you know, global threads. And that is really about going back to the local, right? And that vertical integration with regional and global like advocacy targets. And so I think more of that um, we're starting to see and can you know, really benefit from you know, increased coordination and support um, and, and to that point about supply chains and the need to have increased court, what if we had all of these great experts and this great capacity and really look at how we can deal with, for example, the um, goods coming out of North Korea based on like forced labor that then get sort of uh, channeled through the China and Russia supply chain, sold as made in China, sold in as made in Russia, um, and that are really, you know, only bringing in foreign currency to uh, the North Korean regime. The U.S. has banned imports of goods produced by North Korean forced labor in 2017, but it's still happening and it's happening a lot to the extent that we can look at how is the Kim regime like evading through transshipments and false country of origin labels and do something about that and leverage this, you know, distributed network to support those efforts, I think we would be in a stronger position to protecting democracy. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. You know, when I put the three of your comments together, it really highlights one of the things that we're challenging ourselves here at the endowment, but it's a much broader sort of perspective of how we recognize that this is what I think we sh should rightly call a systemic problem. 
and understanding how the different aspects of this challenge fit together and how it's changing. Here at the forum, we've um, released a terrific paper as well recently by um, Matthew Page and Jody Vittori called Kleptocratic Adaptation. And I think that's where I'd like to sort of turn to the three of you to sort of ask, you know, this is challenges changing. You know, the, the metaphor of whack-a-mole is used, but also the metaphor of sort of spreading water. You know, this one channel is blocked, another goes that way. It's a natural pattern we should expect. Where are you looking next? Where do you see and think we need to be looking if we're going to see where this challenge is growing and how it's evolving? Maybe, Ben, I can start with you, but let's let this be a little bit more conversational. Brett and Zoe, I will look forward to your thoughts as well. Well, I think it's very important not to lose focus on the core Western enablement of international and especially Russian kleptocracy. It's critically important that we move from a phase that's very declarative towards a phase that's defined by action. And one of the key things that needs to happen is we need a strong international coordinating body to do counter kleptocracy. We don't really have one that can coordinate a lot of key challenges. Those are regulatory alignment, getting rid of those regulatory asymmetries mm -hmm. that kleptocrats can pass through. We don't really have an answer to the day-to-day -day problems of data sharing, connecting law enforcement, mm -hmm. highlighting where um, enforcement is failing, even on quite simple matters such as how data is presented in things like suspicious activity reports. And there needs to be an international body that can really, uh, really empower that. And we have a lack of capacity in which we all countries are suffering from a lack of capacity and a lack of ability to focus and a lack of ability to kind of sustain this kind of prioritization over the, the long haul. Establishing such a body which, if you wanted to be ambitious, could also incorporate elements of monitoring the sanctions regime, updating the sanctions regime, being a central repository of Western sanctions regimes, so companies wouldn't need to go to multiple jurisdictions to check what was permitted and what wasn't permitted, could be a really strong proposition. And there are some operations which show us how it could be done. The repo task force set up to go after Russian oligarchs in 2022 is a really good model that could be expanded and empowered. It's a group of countries that have come together that have empowered and given resources to crack teams of investigators to solve this one specific issue, which is Russian kleptocracy. Imagine what could be achieved if we put a body like that with an expanded remit at the core of a new institution which um, could go after kleptocrats all over the world? That's the kind of thing that I'm thinking about. Thank you. Brett, how about you? When you look forward, what are you looking for on this challenge? Sure. Yeah, of course. So, you know, I tend to think, um, I think, you know, I would call our attention to um, you know, what we anticipate from the geopolitical landscape. Hmm. And I think there are, you know, kind of three broad trends that we really need to, um, to be cognizant of. You know, there's been a discussion, you know, about the extent to which, uh, you know, Beijing and Moscow have, you know, have similar um, or, you know, kind of contrasting strategies, uh, presences, et cetera. Um, but I see them, at least from the perspective of the African continent, as quite different. So f from the perspective of the, of the African continent, I think for a long time, we've been centrally preoccupied um, with Chinese influence. And I think for, you know, for, for, for very good reason. But my sense is that crises in China, both economic and political, certainly having to do with uh, the legitimacy of, of the CCP, um, may soon make Beijing uh, a less attractive partner 
um, for for governments across the continent. And I should say that you know we, we've talked a lot about BRI, but you know this is you know, this change, this retrenchment, I think, on the part of Beijing, to some extent, is already happening. Um, the African continent was uh, once the leading recipient of BRI investment by, frankly, a substantial margin. But in the last two years, uh, as debt crises have, uh, have swept the continent, um, Beijing has begun to pivot its BRI investment elsewhere. Think Venezuela, Hungary, Saudi Arabia, um, more financially solvent countries, and perhaps more geopolitically salient, at least you know, arguably. Um, you know, Beijing you know, may get its, its military base on the Atlantic at some point. Obviously, you know, that, that, that remains to be seen. Um, but its military interests, you know, I think, increasingly remain in the South China Sea. So, so I, you know, I think that the, you know, the, the Chinese influence problem, I don't want to say that it will, it will solve itself. It, clearly, it won't. But I think that you know, that could recede. I think that Moscow may prove to be a more intractable, more destabilizing problem. And this is the second trend that I uh, would want to emphasize. We all wondered uh, what would happen to the Wagner group after the Prigozhin assassination. And I think increasingly we have our answer. I mean, it was uh, you know, kind of always kind of an appendage of the GRU, but it's I think now quite clear um, that uh, Wagner has been kind of fully integrated into it. Um, and I think Moscow is making you know, its regime survival in exchange for natural resources uh, proposition totally explicit um, to African governments on, on the verge of collapse. And the upshot of this um, is that Wagner's operations are, uh, I think, appear to be in a way largely self-financing, maybe even profitable, and in any event, clearly advance Moscow's uh, efforts to break um, to break apart the post-Cold War international order. Think providing gold uh, from, Susan, from Sudan uh, that would insulate Moscow uh, from sanctions in response to uh, Ukraine. Think lithium and Mali. Think cutting off French imports uh, of uranium from Niger. Uh, French, unlike most European, uh, France uh, gets most of its, or it gets a much larger share of its energy from nuclear uh, from uh, nuclear sources than the rest of Europe. Niger uh, uh, constitutes about 20% of French uranium imports. Uh, and it's, I think, you know, increasingly clear that Moscow is moving to uh, to, to cut uh, Paris, uh, Paris off um, from, uh, from Niger. Um, then the third trend, you know, that that I think that you know we all need to reckon with, uh, and I think you know Ben's report calls attention, uh, I think more implicitly to this, um, and so I think that you know we as a community um, need to really embrace the sorts of international solutions uh, that um, that Ben has thought about. Anyway, so I think that this is kind of the the geopolitical landscape um, that we all confront. I think it's changing in subtle ways uh, that we haven't yet really begun to think about. Um, but I think that you know the the beginnings of these changes uh, are upon us. Yeah, but what strikes me is when you talk about where it's changing, you listed Hungary, Venezuela, Saudi Arabia. It strikes me it's almost the pattern of seeing more collaboration among more autocratic states, which poses exactly a, right. another set of issues, another set of challenges. That's exactly right. So we, how about you? You you began to talk about some sort of forward looking ways and talking about supply chains and the like. But what would anything you more you'd want to add into this? You know, looking ahead. Um. I mean, my central point is that we absolutely do need, like it is a game of whack-a-mole or whatever you want to call it, but we absolutely do need to rethink how we organize as civil society. And that's why I'm sort of arguing for distributed networks. Distributed networks comes from like computer speak, and it's about, you know, making sure that you have multiple nodes that are totally decentralized, pushing and pulling information, um, processing that information, uh, and so like, you know, you can take one node out, but it's not going to take out the others. And that information gets, again, pushed and pulled through the network uh, without, you know, one head capo, right? And I think for what we're facing, we absolutely need that. We need that capacity. We need to have, for example, investigations that aren't, you know, just like you know, limited by, you know, the global, like the reach of investigative reporters, but also by local researchers local investigators who can talk to and map like the real sort of real life stories of, the, of what's going on on the ground and include that into the larger network of actors who are trying to push for the kind of reforms that I think we're all in agreement with you know and I don't think until we have that distributed network much better connected with the global south that we're going to be able to effectively have the sort of geopolitical solutions that we want Global South is not really on board right now. You know, I've spoken to people from countries 
who have been targets of you know Russian and and and, and Chinese kleptocratic influence. Um, and, and the the question for them is, well, it's corruption, but I see corruption from multiple countries coming in here. So it's not for us to to tell. It's for us to create conditions that allow the people who are locally affected by the problem to really develop research analysis as part of this distributed network. And that is a big enterprise. But you know, going back again to Ben's larger point, you know. Why don't we have this international, like you know, body that I absolutely think would be great? It's because of the lack of the geopolitical will, and without real strong support from the global south, I don't know what, that we get there. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's all. Right there. Thank you. No, look, I think Ben, you, uh, you, you see the discussion your report is sparking, and I think it shows how it's really put its finger on the way we're looking at these challenges going forward. And I wanna just wrap here by thanking you. I wanna call out a couple of key pieces. You know, We've talked about how there's been, in fact, market progress since 2022, you know, and since things happened that we might not have imagined would have been possible, but at the same time, that success has showed its limits. Ben, your work on sort of suggesting that we challenge ourselves to how we understand and think about China's influence. It's echoed in Brett's comments about seeing how that looks like from Africa. And Zoe, I think you did such a powerful job of talking about how, if we want to think about this systemically, because this these distributed networks are a systems theory in a certain sense, and understanding how all of these aspects come together. How, yes, it's sanctions, but sanctions aren't enough. We see the adaptation happening. We see the movement around. How, in fact, though, it's many times we see it's the work of supporting civil society investigative journalists that are out there more than governments are, maybe due to the, in this geopolitical landscape, especially so. And I think this question about how we leverage their work in a connected sort of manner, in a transnational manner, is really sort of the direction that I, a lot of people, and I'm going to take away from this conversation, a sense about how we think about that. So with that, I want to... Um, express my appreciation to the three of you. Thank you. These are just such important issues at a really critical time when it can't but seem more important. Um, I want to express a couple of bit of, a few thanks. I want to express my thanks to Melissa Aiden, Senior Program Officer at the National Endowment for Democracy, who's really led our work in kleptocracy since its inception, and who's critical to reaching out to Ben and developing these ideas that came forward. I want to express appreciation to Ariane Gottlieb for her work, and my colleague Maris Rancy for getting this event together, bringing us together here, and to Chris Walker, our vice president here at the endowment, who's really been leading this work for quite some time. Um, I encourage all of you to come to our website, check out the report itself, follow us on Twitter at thinkdemocracy, we're at www.ned.org backslash ideas, check us out on LinkedIn. We're really eager to sort of continue this conversation, would welcome others of you who've read the report can take that and join this conversation online as we continue it here. So with that, once again, let me send a thanks to all of you for being with us. Ben, thanks for starting us off on a really important conversation. And I wanna thank you all and wish you well.